Okay, got some really interesting data on the um, rolling Justin Trudeau photo scandal. Um, I am going to flash the Patreon banner big time on this one because YouTube demonetized my last video on this subject from Friday. Even though this is major news, it's it's made like international U news. YouTube is demonetizing analysis of this major story of Justin Trudeau wearing brown face and black face. Um, nine, 18 to 20 some odd years ago. So they'll probably demonetize the same thing again. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Patreon. Patreon. You should become a member. Patreon. Okay. So the reason I'm following up on this is twofold. I, I want to I wanna talk about, because you know how I'm all about strategies at work, right? Versus just outrage. Um, so an interesting bit of data came down the pipe. And the, and the thing I find interesting about this story is it's, it, it is covered in the National Post, which is... To say it is conservative is is putting it very lightly. Um, you'll you'll notice the ad in in the article itself is is for Andrew Shear in a story that's actually positive in terms of Trudeau. Uh, let me square. Let me yeah. There we go. A little better now. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> I I don't know how to feel about newspapers running ads for a particular candidate, but hey, capitalism, right? The National Post is so in the tank. A big problem with, with this election is that there really is no left-leaning major media outlet anymore in in Canada, except for our uh, FU network on iTunes and, and various things. Um the Toronto Star is sort of a mixed bag. Uh, CBC has turned quite right wing, perhaps because their um, viewers are are older than average. But you know, Globe and Mail is definitely conservative. National Post is like crazy conservative. But the National Post uh, had to run this article. And it's about how did Canadians react to Trudeau's blackface photos with the big meh pulse fight. Now, I notice that the media narrative has turned from brownface to, oh, they were all blackface, which is obviously a very different, more, um, more, more historically, um, troubling trend. There, there was no... Uh, historical sort of Jim Crow related um, type of theater entertainment connected to brownface the way it was with blackface. So they're they're ramping up the scandal, even though it turns out and Abacus Data is not is not left leaning. It turns out forty two percent polled weren't really bothered. Um, but a deeper dive into the numbers is even more interesting. Forty-two uh, percent, you're like, oh, fifty-eight percent still care a lot. No, not so. Um, there's no evidence that this fundamentally changed anything. Oh, another conservative attack ad. Look at that, right in the corner. Um, the uh, where? Where's all the numbers? Um, oh wow, they're really burying this. Isn't that funny? Um, go away. This is full of of conservative propaganda, this website. But um, here we go. 42% weren't really bothered. 34% um, they said they didn't like it, but they accepted his apology. And then this is the number that just, oh, these are bad numbers for the conservatives on this scandal. Um, one quarter, two thirds of whom were conservative voters said they were truly offended and that it damaged their view of the prime minister. Now that means one third of one quarter of voters that Justin Trudeau could potentially have vote for him. Those are the only ones that cared. And there's no sure thing with that. They could be stalwart um, 
NDP, that's our, our <laughs> that was our previously left wing party before Trudeau flanked them on the left uh, or, or Green Party supporters. So we're talking about, you know, one third of one quarter of the electorate that was at all swayed. And it's fascinating, no matter how much the media tries to make this into a U.S. style personality driven election, Canadians want to talk about issues. Housing is a big thing. Healthcare is always a big thing. Um, you know, Trump is a huge thing up here because of the tariffs and the various disruptions to our economy. But it really, really seems that cost of living is is going to be the big election issue so far. That could change. But cost of living, not how much money you make or how much money you keep, but actual cost of living, cost of things like housing, cell phone bills, utilities, that kind of thing. This seems to be the big issue of this election. Um, but I want to pivot from that. There's time to talk about that. And if you're interested in this sort of things, please check out uh, the the FU network. We do a ton of I'm a I'm a panelist on a show called the No Bullpen um, periodically. But um, the, uh, the I want to talk more generally about why these numbers may be the way they are in Canada. We are not as a whole, you know, broad strokes, an outrage cons uh, culture. We we just aren't like that as a people. We we get our um our social progress not through big revolutions, but by um being funny and charming and sometimes just waiting and being patient and having discussions and going that makes sense, let's do it. And um you know, the it, it was so fascinating when I did, you know, research on first wave feminism to see that the difference between what was going on in the UK, where they were, you know, bombing places, and, and in the US, which was much more of a, you know, outrage, um, protest movement, the, the Canadian universal suffrage movement used a lot more humor and kind of tongue in cheek stuff. And no, this is fun. Come on in. And, and that's sort of how we've always been as a people, I think, a lot because our weather sucks all year round. We might get like a month in spring and then two weeks in fall when it isn't inhospitable in some way. So it takes a lot to get us really incensed by stuff. But what's interesting is that true bigotry does piss us off. The reason that Justin Trudeau got elected the first time around, in part, was because then the conservative uh, government of Stephen Harper attempted to leverage um, almost like a nationalist patriotism, bringing up um, old stock or pure len Canadians. That means like pure wool. It's a Quebecois term. But like Canadians who have basically been around for real white people, right? They tried to leverage that the way it kind of worked in the U.S. And it didn't work here. People were just like, nope. Uh, federally, any any concept of a, of a niqab ban or a religious symbols ban, stuff like that's very popular in Quebec, but not across the country. Even in otherwise conservative areas, Canadians don't go in for that. And as a people, I'm not saying we're perfect. Our big national shame is the treatment of, of indigenous Canadians. And so I'm removing that issue from what I'm about to say for the rest of it, because, you know, even then it kind of applies, but uh, we do collectively have a blind spot when it comes to that issue. But um, we're, I think in a lot of ways, handling it better and this isn't to sound superior this is just maybe it's lucky maybe it's because of our system of government but we're addressing it much sooner and we're having the hard conversations now there's a whole series called first contact that actually is is putting indigenous people and in, in people who have you know kind of um 
you know, less than ideal views or, or stereotyped views of indigenous people together and like getting people to talk. And, and that that's what I'm going to talk about today is getting outraged about racism is worthless if it doesn't actually lead to a reduction in bigotries. Um, and this was something I learned the hard way when I was doing gay rights stuff back when it was still called gay, gay rights and stuff, you know, LGBTQ2 plus um, stuff. Now it was just gay rights back then uh, in the 90s, uh, you know, when Trudeau was doing his costume thing. Um, but uh, we found that if you just raged at people, if you tried to shame them, you didn't get anywhere except a beating. Um, if you were cool and let people be uncomfortable and have the conversations and just normalize things, just just let people laugh and let people be uncomfortable and, and take that tension off, it worked really, really well. And both anecdotal and, you know, and, you know, research studies show that you can't, yell at someone to make them a better person. You can't shame a person into being more open-minded. You you have to have a series of conversations. And I mean there's a there's the famous story of, you know, uh, a son of white supremacists who started going to Friday night dinners at a Jewish college friend's house when nobody else would I don't know if it was a house the door, I don't know, but this this Jewish kid invited him to dinners when no one else wanted to associate with the guy because he was, you know, the son of a white supremacist and held those views at the time. But this this one kid, he was like, and he he lost friends over this, but he's like, nope, I'm going to talk to him. And that that humanization, that decent treatment was was the thing that started the guy on the journey to break away from white supremacy. Uh, there's a what's a Christian Piccolino? I believe his name is. He's he's a very famous guy. Some people claim he's controversial, everyone, but he tells a similar story about how he used to work at a record store as a front for white supremacist music when he was like fairly high up in in white supremacist stuff. And, you know, apparently gradually he started realizing that he actually had more in common with the the black and Jewish people that came in for other kinds of music than he did with these white supremacists that were supposed to be like his brothers. And he he began to break away from that. Um, that's how you do it. And so I think Canadians, since we do tend to live more in cities, especially, you know, center to left wing Canadians, we tend to be more urban Um myself not included. Um, although, although I, you know, I was born very, very urban, um, but uh, uh, not anymore. Um, but we tend to be more urban. We, we tend to know more people of different races. And so I think everybody has a journey. I think we're a little bit more comfortable talking about this stuff. Um, our, you know, national conversation on race isn't like one big thing and okay, then it's over like America seems to expect it is. Um, it's a series of conversations as different immigrant waves come over, whether they be economic migrants or or refugees, you know, they we we have a mosaic multiculturalism, so people aren't expected to assimilate. But as, you know, people start moving into your area and getting really good restaurants and food stores, uh, <laughs> um, you, you come into contact with more and more people of of different different races, different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, all that stuff. And uh, it, that creates interesting conversations. And this whole, this whole idea started percolating because my husband was interviewed by BBC Radio 4, I think, um, on this whole thing. And the, the host on it was like, asked if, well, if Justin Trudeau gets reelected, doesn't this mean he got away with it? Like, don't you have to send a message? And this this host was baffled that Canadians just don't care. Um, and 
that that stuck with me. I was like, when I listened to it, I was like, what? Like, no, he didn't get away with it. He was internationally shamed for dumb stuff he did, um, you know, 17 years ago. It's it's brown face Les Mis, you know, he broke his yellow card and he has to hide the whole time. Um, and I think that because we we don't stay in our silos in this country as as severely, though it is getting worse, um, we all kind of think back and go, yeah, I had stupid views on things back in the day and I had to evolve. Um, and I think everybody sort of relates in a way. And I think that because... I'm not I'm not saying there's no racism in Canada. There certainly is racism in Canada, but I think that because overall the the quality the basic quality of life in this country is better, people can be more forgiving. And this idea that you must run someone off the face of the earth to show you're serious about racism, not only is it really disturbing, kind of in its in its scorched earth cruelty but but also it's just ineffective and it's it's kind of cool to see this take place it's kind of cool to see sort of the na- the national forgiving spirit of Canada happen you know in front of the world and i think the world the reason i'm making this video is i think the world's getting a really messed up idea about what it means it's not that we don't care about racism it's that we know that the way to combat this stuff is by allowing people the ability to be rewarded for improving because if you don't give someone an off-ramp to bigotry, if you don't give someone the chance to be better, they're going to sink further and further and further into these, you know, high-tension, uh, highly bigoted communities because people can't survive on their own no matter how introverted they are. And, uh, you know, it, it's sort of people need a community. And if those I don't even like saying far right because it has nothing to do with like fiscal conservatism these like you know these groups based on really virulent identity politics um if that's the only place people have to go well they're gonna stay there aren't there you have to welcome people back in who made mistakes in the past and it's it's really nice to see Canadians be thoughtful enough and and non-reactive enough to go yeah that bothered me if he was still that guy I I would have a problem with that but he's not that guy anymore except for a very unfortunate um trip to India where he dressed in like Bollywood outfit but he was he was pilloried for it then like you you can see the learning curve. I think that was part of the reason a lot of people weren't terribly surprised by this because he dressed up in something similar minus the brown face paint early in his term as prime minister. You know, he 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 still had some learning to do. And uh I don't know which of his people thought that was a good idea, but there you have it. Um but uh you know this and, and I, I want to touch on the people who do kind of feel that, well, he was a hypocrite. And and that's absolutely true. I mean, the fact that he was, he was lecturing people on things when he had this in his past, um, that's a totally fair thing to take issue with. And I think if anything, that's the part that he still needs to square in in his re-election campaign is how is this going to change his approach is he going to stop the the kind of tisk tisk you know sexism in video games and people kind and all that stuff if he if he cuts that out i think everyone will be happier other than a very small slice of the hard left 
nobody really likes that. We look around that um, when forming our opinions of him. Uh, because, I mean, he has done a lot of good for um, various communities, both immigrant communities and, you know, um, multicultural communities who, who were born in Canada. Uh, he, he has done a lot. He started the Indigenous Reconciliation Process, which is a hard and thankless task. And somebody had to start it. And no matter who started it, some people were never going to be happy and some people were going to be angry he did it at all. And so I think that all that ha has allowed like Canadians to go, we're going to judge the whole person and not something someone did, you know, 17 years ago. It also doesn't hurt that the people, the, the party, the conservatives led by Andrew Scheer, who are all, oh, you should resign and all that stuff. Their leader, Andrew Scheer, um, more recently said derogatory things about gay people and will not apologize. And that speaks more. When somebody won't apologize, you can assume they still hold those views or at least they're okay with those views. They don't say those views are wrong. And, and that's the only... That's the only thing I don't think quite squares on the hypocrisy argument. Hear me out, okay? Because hypocrisy basically means you have different standards. It's say one thing, do another, yes. But um, it's also having different standards for one group of people than another. Now, hypocrisy would basically be it's not racist if we do it, right? That's, that's not Trudeau's position. His his position of was it's racist if anybody does it, including me. He actually called his behavior in those photos racist, even though he wasn't aware of it at the time. And some people say, oh, how could you not know it was racist? Uh, I've talked to a lot of people. Um, part of it is that the definition of blackface has it has evolved. It it it's widened to any darkening of one's skin as a form of costume from the, you know, the, the, I'm not even going to describe it because some people are really offended by it. Um, but it was a very specific makeup, including a lighter line around the lips. That was what was considered blackface up until fairly recently. Um, I think maybe the, the Ralph Northam scandal might've helped widen that definition. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how, how certain things change and how definitions change. But Trudeau didn't defend it. He didn't say it was OK because he's done all this stuff for, you know, non-white Canadians since then. He said it was racist, which is a consistent belief system. Now, I haven't seen an example of Justin Trudeau saying a person, even Donald Trump, was racist. Uh, he condemned, he actually took some hell a while back for referring to Trump's, I think it was the uh, go back where you came from stuff. He referred to it as unacceptable. He didn't use the word racist and he actually took criticism for that. So as annoying as his like social justice veneer was he actually has been tougher on himself than he was on other people and and that's not making excuses for him that that's you know a dispassionate analysis of no wait if we actually look at um look at what he has condemned and how he has condemned it um he has been fairly consistent in his views i could be wrong i can't think of him calling that many people like a racist like they are racist through and through he has said things are racist um but uh yeah you you gotta be really careful with accusations of hypocrisy because they are an act an accusation and you do have to prove it and hypocrisy isn't simply being wrong it's actually being you know two-faced in a way and, well, you know, people are like, well, why, why didn't he say anything about it? I, 
I actually think his explanation makes sense. He was too embarrassed. If you know any of these um, holy roller social justice types, they all have something like this in their past. They all have some sort of deep, dark secret. And that's why they see horrible racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia, you know, behind every corner. Because it it was in them. A piece of it might still be in them. People who don't um, have those skeletons, you know, ha have those demons inside them, they tend to make the assumption, like I do, that most people aren't hateful. They're, they're just kind of ignorant or naive in terms of things. They picked up some bad habits from their family that they don't realize bother certain people. But either there's no ill intent or they're doing it knowing it's offensive. And I'll, I'll close with a, an interesting story that there, there was like a, a chat online and... Um, <sighs> based on another thing that I'm not going to get into because it's full of a whole bunch of racial slurs I can't even repeat. But I um, mentioned, you know, well, somebody's seen Clerks 2 one too many times and the people who are younger than me hadn't seen Clerks 2. So I found that scene in Clerks 2 where they, they have a character using extremely racist language to actually outline how when people grow up, when racism is normalized in a family, um, people, like the kids that grew up in that environment don't know a word is racist. And it's absolutely hilarious. Rosario Dawson's face in the whole thing just makes it. Uh, Wanda Sykes is hilarious in it as the outraged customer. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, really sharp comedy that you can't do anymore because just using those words, even to show that they're wrong, is is now verboten for 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 most people. Um, you know, and that's too bad because I really think that scenes like that make very strong statements about where racism comes from and and what you can do to lessen it. And I say lessen it very deliberately because we're, nev we're never going to stomp out completely uh, tribalism or xenophobia or, 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 you know, weird ideas that people have about people who are different from each other. You, you can teach um, openness to difference to an extent, but I, I do think that a lot of people either... I mean, I mean, it's a it's a big five personality trait, right? How open you are to new ideas. Um, I happen to be very open to new ideas. I'm like, what? Tell me more. No matter how weird it is. Like, if you see my Twitch channel, you'll, you'll see that. It's pretty much, what? Oh, okay. What kind of cool fetish is this? We're talking about fetishes tonight? Great. Let's, let's have at it. You know, I love to learn. Um, not everybody's like that. Some people have very like... <gasps> reactions to anything different and they're actually quite fearful of difference I feel really bad for those people because they're missing out on a lot of really cool stuff um but yeah interesting to hear your thoughts not rages because let's be very Canadian okay everybody in the comment section is an honorary Canadian um which means uh you're probably about half drunk right now and a little bit cold um doesn't matter if it's like nine o'clock, somebody's drunk somewhere in Canada at nine o'clock. Um, but uh, yeah, just just try to express your viewpoint without the outrage. I think you'll see you get a much better result. The world needs more Canada. All right, so you know what's coming next. Where is it? Patreon, Patreon, you should become a member because they're definitely going to demonetize this video.